Thank you, Enrico. Uh, good morning, everybody. I, I first, I, I want to uh, give you a word of warning that I had very little sleep in the next in the last two days, so I, I may stumble or, or collapse. Uh, that's normal. Um, it's it's a great pleasure to be here. So indeed, I, I uh, as Enrico said, I, I am based at Lawrence Livermore National Laboratory. Uh, if you don't know where it is, it's uh, near San Francisco in the, in the Bay Area. Uh, and at Livermore, Livermore is a is a special lab from the uh, uh, Department of Energy in the in the U.S. Uh, my main task over there is to develop a program of theoretical fission studies for or applications, which are many. So um, the the goal of my lecture here is to give you a very broad overview of fission theory. I'm not going to talk much or even at all about fission experiments. Um, I the the, the the main objective is not necessarily that you become an expert at the end, but that you see some of the challenges that we are facing, all the different aspects of fission. Uh, and if you're interested, you will have access to some material. You can you know, go a, a little bit deeper. Uh, I have organized, we have four blocks of two hours, well, an hour and 45 minutes. So I've organized my lecture into four sessions. Uh, today, it's going to be very easy. Uh, it's going to be a long introduction on on the physics of fission, let's say. Um, I'm mostly going to draw some sketches on the blackboard, and it's been a long time since I've uh, written on the blackboard, and I should not have dressed in black, uh, but OK. Um, tomorrow, we are going to talk about how we can use nuclear structure methods, uh, st nuclear structure theory methods, to get some additional information about fission. Uh, then on Wednesday, this is going to be ready computing fission observables, things that can be measured experimentally, and how we can use those theoretical methods to make predictions. And then on uh, Friday, for the last uh, last block, uh, I will show you a little bit how we can use some more advanced theoretical methods uh, to make additional predictions. So there's going to be a progression during the week. We're going to start gentle and nice and easy, and then it's going to get perhaps slightly more difficult. Um, I have looked very briefly at the profile of you guys. Uh, you seem to have a very broad range of expertise. I think everybody is either a PhD student or a postdoc, right? There isn't anybody who is a master, at master level or bachelor, correct? Okay. Uh, and I have also seen that you do anything from quarks and gluons to fission to experimental nuclear physics. Uh, just let me ask you a couple of questions before we start. Is anybody familiar with second quantization? Or let's say, any, anybody is not familiar with second quantization? It's okay if you're not. I need to know because I want to adjust the level. If, if some people have no idea what second quantization is, then I, I would do a quick reminder at some point. Uh, if everybody is kind of familiar, I can skip the, the intro. So everybody seems to be okay. Nah, you, you are, you are. I will. I will. It's not going to be very, it's going to come tomorrow only, and it's not going to be very complicated. Uh, so we'll, I'll try to adjust. So that's actually, uh, let me, this is a good uh, opportunity to uh, remind you that you should feel free to ask questions. You should interrupt me if you don't understand what I say because I speak too fast, because my accent is bad, because I'm not clear. Just raise your hand and speak, because otherwise I will keep going. Okay. Um, let's see. Any questions at this point? No. Yes, you, I, I actually, you should really think of this as uh, don't be shy to ask questions because you have a very big opportunity to ask a question that I cannot answer. It's always nice to embarrass the speaker. So you should feel free. I mean, I can tell you if your question is smart, I'm not going to be able to answer it. So uh, again, don't hesitate. 
Um, as I said, today we are going to start very nice and easy. I'm going to, I have followed the instructions of the organizers, so most of the lecture is going to be, I'm going to write on the blackboard. Uh, but then once in a while I'm going to show a few slides, mostly today actually. Uh, there will be a few more tomorrow and uh, I think the rest of the week, but most of the slides are going to be for today. In fact, we're going to start with a couple of slides because in the spirit of you know easing into it, I wanted to remind you about the history of nuclear fission. Uh, in fact, on where is this? There you go. On the um, on the left here, you have uh, a few significant dates for the history of nuclear physics. Some people like to make it go all the way back to 1896 with the discovery of radioactivity by Becquerel. Uh, in 1911, the nucleus was discovered through a scattering experiments by Rutherford. I personally think that the, the birth of nuclear physics in 1932, when uh, Chadwick discovered that inside the, the atom, there was inside the nucleus, there were neutrons and protons, not just protons in some sea of, of neutral matter, but actual two types of particles, protons and neutrons. Uh, in 1935, this is what you probably, uh, you may have uh, seen this uh, beta weizsäcker mass formula or liquid drop model. Uh, I mention it here because it's one of the first quantitative attempts to, to calculate some uh, nuclear uh, properties, and we're going to use it uh, especially at the beginning of this week. So I wanted to uh, just put this date. Fission itself was discovered in 1939, technically in 1938 in December, by these two gentlemen, uh, Anne and Strassmann. They were making experiments because uh, I think a couple of years earlier, Enrico Fermi had discovered that if you bombarded some elements with neutrons, then you could make heavier elements. Uh, and we know it today because the, what's happening is beta decay. Some, the neutrons are captured, turn into protons, and so by doing this, you can just go up in, in the table of uh, elements. So everybody was busy trying to make heavier and heavier elements by bombarding stuff. And uh, what Anne and Strassmann did is they bombarded uranium isotopes with neutrons, which nowadays you would think it's a very bad idea, but they did it. And what they found is instead of observing something heavier than uranium, they observed barium. So they started with Z equal, oh yes, by the way, in the US we say Z, but in Europe we say Z. And I'm, I'm probably gonna mix the two. Sometimes it's gonna be Z, sometimes it's gonna be Z. Uh, my heart tells me I should say Z, but I've been living in the US for too long now, so I say Z. So instead of uh, observing something heavier than uh, uranium, they observed barium isotopes, 56. And so the time is like, what's going on? And it's uh, Lisa Meitner, this lady here, who made the intellectual leap to realize that what happened was, well, that nucleus of uranium has, had split in two, and this was fission. So this is uh, the, uh, an excerpt from a paper here where she recalled the, uh, the uh, experimental discovery, and she was explaining it by saying that a nucleus can be thought of indeed as a, as a liquid drop, and if you agitate it, if you bring it additional energy, that energy could be sufficient to make the, the, the drop deform and break into two fragments. So this was the qualitative, qualitative uh, explanation for fission. Uh, six months later, and I am always amazed at that, there was this paper by Niels Bohr, the, the Niels Bohr and uh, John Archibald Wheeler. Uh, this is received in June 1939, and they came up with the first comprehensive model of nuclear fission. This is one of these seminal papers, as we call them, uh, that people always go back to because there is a ton of information in there. And I am extremely impressed that this was done just six months after the discovery. And remember, this was before internet, so it's not like they knew it two seconds after the discovery. It's like, oh yeah, we found fission. It took time for the information to percolate. And so in, in that little amount of time, they came up with a quantitative or semi-quantitative description of fission as a deformation process. So they recognized that what was going on is the nucleus was deforming itself up to the point where it was splitting into two fragments. They also recognized that in that deformation process, uh, well, that means the energy of the nucleus was changing as a function of that deformation and quantifying that effect would allow you to get information about the process. They came up with a model for the probability for that fission process to happen 
using uh, a model of uh, particle evaporation that had been introduced by George Gamow for Apadike just four years earlier, I believe. So they came up with quantitative predictions of the, of the, the fission uh, uh, probability, let's say. They came up with a concept of fission cross-section. Uh, we're gonna talk a lot about fission cross-section. This is the probability of fission relative to other possible decays of the nucleus. So to calculate the fission cross-section, you need to know what's the probability that the nucleus is going to fission, but you also need to know what's the probability that it does other things, like emit a neutron or emitting photons or doing anything else. And they even came up with uh, some theory for what happened to the fission fragments. Uh, once these fragments are formed, they are typically excited, and because they are excited, they are going to de-excite by emitting things, and among other things, what happens is the beta decay. And so they, they had some discussion about the, uh, the beta decay of this uh, fission problem. So this is a very impressive paper that uh, makes us realize that these were really very smart people and we are not at that level. But uh, we a lot of the concepts that we use today in fission theory can be traced back to that paper. Okay, so now I am going to start looking at my notes to remember what I wanted to say and then uh, write things on the blackboard. So, let's start by, again, this is gonna be mostly qualitative now. I'm gonna, we're gonna talk about what is exactly fission and I'm gonna talk about induced fission first uh, to introduce most of the concepts simply because it's a little bit easier. So in neutron induced fission, and well, okay, that's already a first uh, lapsus. I was, uh, I said that I was, I would be talking about induced fission. Most of the applications use neutron induced fission. So a neutron hitting a nucleus, so you have a nucleus here, that's supposed to be a nucleus, and then you have an incident particle, which typically would be a neutron, and that guy is going through the nucleus, and then several things can happen. The first thing that can happen is that, well, that neutron is not gonna be captured by the nucleus, it's gonna be scattered. And it's gonna be scattered without any exchange of energy. The nucleus is gonna be intact, the neutron or the incident particle is simply deflected. Okay, so this is the first situation and this is called elastic scattering. No fission. Second scenario is, well, I still have my nucleus. I have, to, I have to draw different nucleus. Now it has a different shape. I have my neutron and again, it's coming in. It's still deflected, but my nucleus is now excited. There's been some exchange of energy and uh, the nucleus is in excited state. This is called inelastic scattering. If you want to know the probability of fission, or actually if you want to know the fission cross-section, you also have to know what's the probability that these things happen. That's why I, I start discussing it. And then the third scenario is, uh, well, is actually fission. Um, oh, it's not, sorry, it's not fission yet. Again, the nucleus, yet again with a different shape. My neutron is coming in, and this time it's captured by the nucleus. And this is called, very logically, neutron capture. Okay, at this point, you say, okay, the nucleus is, the neutron has been absorbed, my nucleus is gonna fission, right? Not yet, because uh, what happens when the uh, neutron is uh, captured, the nucleus, well, the nucleus initially had Z protons and N minus one, just because I used N minus one in my notes, N minus one neutrons, if it captures a neutron, then it, uh, it becomes, uh, this becomes Z protons and N neutrons. Now, let's have a look a little bit at the energy balance. The mass of a nucleus with Z proton and N neutrons is the sum of the mass of its constituents, so, this would be the sum of the Z, the mass of the, uh, the proton times the number of protons plus 
n times the uh, mass of the neutrons. And then, because the system is bound, there is a binding energy that keeps it together and lowers the total energy of the system. So we have to subtract the binding energy for the nucleus with z protons and n neutrons. And I will take the convention that the binding energy here is positive. Okay? So we can look at the mass balance of this reaction here. One neutron plus a nucleus with z protons and n minus one neutron. So on, on before the neutron is captured, I have my single neutron. I have my nucleus, which has z proton plus n minus 1 neutron. And then on the right hand side, when the, the neutron has been absorbed, I now have a nucleus that has uh, still z proton and neutrons, and, oh, I forgot the binding energy. There you go. So let me let me actually write it on the on the next board. That's going to be easier. So we have, let's start again, M uh, the mass of one neutron, the mass of Z protons, N minus one neutron minus the binding energy of the system, and then on the right-hand side, I have just my uh, z protons, n neutrons, and then the binding energy of the system. I will allow that system to be in an excited state. We're going to see in a minute that if it's not, that equality could not hold. So if it, is, if it is an excited state, I can add some term here, which is the excitation energy of that system. And I just simplify things, these things go away, these go away with that, and I am left with the excitation energy, which is by definition and if you are familiar with uh, what this is, this is the sep this quantity here, the difference between the binding energy of a system with z protons and n, n neutrons and the binding energy of the system with z protons and n minus one neutrons is the separ the one neutron separation energy in that system with z protons and n neutrons. So indeed, the system is in an excited state. Do you anybody knows what the typical neutron energy separation energies are in a in a heavy nucleus? Order of magnitude? A little bit less than 10, but yeah, it's in a heavy nucleus, it's going to be like 5, 6. In lighter mass, uh, it's, it can go up to 7, 8 MeV, but that's, yeah, that's the ballpark, okay? So this would be in, say, uranium or plutonium or this kind of uh, nuclei that uh, we are interested in fission. This is going to be of the order of, let's say, between 5 and 8 MeV. Uh, just a uh, you know, ballpark estimate. Now, at this point, I have actually not really assumed that the neutron had a, an incident kinetic energy, but in practice, it could have some energy, in which case I would have an additional term here, which would be the kinetic energy of the neutron, and then we'd find that it would show up here. So if we have a neutron, and there are some special reactions, for example, in a fusion reaction, DT fusion reaction, a neutron is emitted at 14 MeV. And if that neutron now hits a nucleus like uranium or plutonium, it's going to put that uranium or plutonium in a very highly excited state. Okay, so this is going to be proportional to this and that. Okay, so um, we have our nucleus in an excited state. And now what happens? Well, first of all, what is the meaning of neutron separation energy? It's the energy it needs for a nucleus to be able to release a neutron. So the first thing that can happen to this excited nucleus, it can actually emit a neutron. It has enough energy to emit a neutron. So we may be in a situation that we have made a camp, sorry, we have made a nucleus here in an excited state, but it's not going to fission. It's going to re-emit that neutron uh, immediately because it has enough energy to do so. So even though 
so neutron capture does not always lead to fission. It can lead to, so after neutron capture, what we can have is we can have neutron emission. We can also emit photons. We have tons of energy. We can also emit gamma, gamma rays, so gamma emission. Or we can fission. There could be other exotic mechanism. We could think of beta decay. We could think of uh, you know alpha particles or things like this. But in practice, for most nuclei, this is really what happens. Now, one more uh, thing about the. Um, let's see where am I here? So one more thing about this energy here. Um, this is actually a pretty high number. Uh, I'm not going to get into a theory of uh, what is known as level densities. I'm just going to give you a formula, uh, which I need to really check uh, this is. But uh, in the nucleus that is excited, the density of states, the total density of states at energy E is, uh, I'm going to just give the proportionality, and it's going to be exponential to AU. This is 5 over 4, uh, where U is the energy minus the, new, the pairing gap, and A is called the level density parameter, and this is typically of the order of 10, I mean, give or take, uh, they are. So there is, uh, there are ways to compute the density of states in the nucleus at, as a function of the energy of that nucleus. There are different models that can be uh, invoked to do this. Uh, in fact, there are people who do their, spend their life trying to come up with better estimates of this level density. We're going to talk again about level density in the course of this week because it's a very important quantity for, uh, for fission. Here I'm just giving a very simple estimate based on a model called the Gilbert and Cameron uh, model. It's very often used in uh, calculations. And it tells you that the density is proportional to the exponential of the energy. Uh, well, plus this is, gonna be this, this is going to dominate over that term. So even at 5, 8 MeV, you have a large density of states very large density of states. And what that, uh, the consequence of this is that we can assume that when the neutron is absorbed, it can interact with so many different configurations in the system that it's basically going to be, uh, it's going to thermalize the system. So the neutron, the, the, sorry, the, the nucleus, after it has absorbed the neutron, is going to get into a, a state of equilibrium and this is known as the compound nucleus. So the neutron, the, the nucleus, after absorbing the neutron, becomes a compound nucleus at this particular excitation energy. And we can uh, then assume that the decay of that compound nucleus is going to be independent of the way it was formed. Let me see. I think I can now. So compound nucleus is, uh, this is thermalization of the system. And this also means that the nucleus loses the memory of how it was formed. And this means that uh, when the nucleus is, yeah, oh, sorry. What is what? Oh, delta, uh, the pairing gap. The pairing gap in, uh, anybody knows what that pairing gap is? What the, the meaning of a pairing gap? Or should I explain quickly? Yes, please. So in, um, so this is a digression because we're going to go back to it tomorrow, in fact. Uh, in, uh, in the nucleus, 
we have okay, protons and neutrons, and it turns out that protons and neutrons, pretty much like people, like to be, be in pairs. And so they form, uh, this is known as a pairing phenomenon. Uh, in even, even nuclei, and this, this phenomenon has been observed from experimental data. When you look at the excitation energy of even, even nuclei, you find that the first excited state is quite higher than it is in an odd mass nucleus. And the reason, the way we understand that is because in an, in an even, even nucleus, all the particles can be in pairs, and that brings additional binding energy to the system. So it costs more to break a pair and put the system in an excited state. And that uh, the amount of pairing correlations in the nucleus is typically quantified by this, quanti this quantity here, delta, which is, roughly speaking, uh, going to be proportional to the energy of the first excited state. Did that answer the, is it kind of clear? Yes? Oh, you mean here, yes. Absolutely correct. More questions? Excellent question that I can hopefully answer. Um, so I'm going to give you an immediate consequence of this approximation. If the nucleus loses the memories of how it was formed and the decay becomes then independent of the entrance channel of how it was formed, uh, we can test that hypothesis because we can make the same nucleus using different reaction mechanisms and then look at the decay. And if the decay is the same, then that has the, that, that hypothesis has been tested. This is known as the Bohr hypothesis, and in practice, it, is, it has been validated experimentally many times. So one way to do this is, for example, uh, you take, let's say, uh, a nucleus, say uranium-235, just for the sake of argument. Uh, so I, actually, let's, let's uh, write it down, because this is indeed an important um, uh, hypothesis. So here is an example, an illustration of how it would work. You would take uh, uranium-235, sorry, you add a neutron, and then you look at uh, the, the fission of this thing. And when you make, when the neutron is absorbed, let's uh, make the reaction, let's assume we are, I mean, in experiment it's not necessarily easy to do this, but this is on the blackboard, so I can do whatever I want, and I can say that I'm going to make uranium-236. This is first going to go to uranium-236, and then it's going to fission. And it's going to make uranium-236 at energy E, angular momentum J, and parity pi. And then I'm going to take uranium-236, in its ground state, and I am going to excite it with gamma rays. I'm going to shoot photons at, at, that, at that thing. Well, it's still, this is actually an excited uranium-236. Oops. This is also leading to an excited uranium-236. And then I'm going to look at the fission of this guy. I can adjust my neutron kinetic energies or and my photon energies such that the system is here at the same energy. I cannot exactly do the same thing with angular momentum because neutrons and photons have different properties with respect to spins, but I can make it as close as it can. So it's going to be actually almost J prime is going to be close to J. I mean, I'm, I'm not quantifying it very much here, but this is Trust me, it's going to be close. And then the parity is so is going to be fine. When you look at the fission properties of these two uh, reaction mechanisms, you find that they are very, very similar. And this is a strong suggestion that this hypothesis is valid. Now, reaction theorists also have um, developed models to bypass the, or to uh, say, uh, 
to consider the case where the incident particle, whether it's a neutron or something else, is not leading to the formation of a compound nucleus, but is interacting with some very specific states in the target nucleus, and this is known as direct reactions. So there is a whole class of theoretical methods to deal with this kind of uh, uh, reactions where the incident particle interacts with some specific configurations in the system. For fission, this is not very important, but for other types of reaction it is. And I believe that next week, Pierre Capel, is gonna t who is going to give a, a lecture on reaction theory, is going to talk mostly about this type of reactions uh, because he's interested in other things. Yeah, answer your question? Yeah. More questions? Where was I? Okay, so um, now let me try where I'm supposed to be now. Okay, so now we have, um, we have formed our compound nucleus at uh, some excitation energy. And I've told you that, well, several things can happen, but I'm mostly interested in fission, and this is why you're here. So we're gonna talk about the case weight fissions. So let's try to make a sketch of things. And here we are going very much to follow, again, the intuition of this gentleman here. Uh, this is the deformation process. The nucleus at that excitation energy is going to be able to deform. We're going to see later how and why, but let's, for now, let's take it for granted. It's deforming. If it fissions, if it breaks in two, then if I plot things as if this axis represents the deformation, and I don't specify what it is now, it's just deformation, then there is a point where I can say that the shape is such that I have my two fragments. Okay? Somewhere at much uh, smaller deformation, I know that my energy, my nucleus, is in some potential well, this is the ground state potential well. And that means that in this axis, I'm showing the uh, potential energy as a function of the deformation. Okay? So I have a potential well corresponding to the ground state of the nucleus. Uh, there can be excited states in that, in that potential well. And I know that I have made, so let's say this is I'm going to, uh, with respect to this ground state energy, which I'm going to take as zero energy here, I know that I have made my compound nucleus at an energy which I still call E star. If my nucleus fissions, I'm now looking at the case where it does fission, what can I say about the potential, the deformation potential energy? Yes? Somebody? Can it do something like that? That's actually a trick question because in quantum mechanics you could always tunnel through. So technically, yes, it could do. But if we observe fission, if we observe a lot of fission, that means that we have to be always under that limit here. So Binding energy has to do something. I don't know if it's going down like that, or like this, or like that, but it has to stay lower than the excitation energy. Otherwise, we would not see fission in as much uh, quantity as we see it experimentally, okay? So we have a potential energy that does like that, and then we arrive at this point, and I will call this the scission point, the point where the nucleus really split in two fragments. This is the scission point. And now, at this session point, what can I say about the energy of the system, by the way? The energy of the nucleus, the energy, the, I have made my compound nucleus at this excitation energy here. What can I say about the energy of the system as it deforms all the way to session? Concert. If there isn't any, and I'm, I should have specified that, but I am not considering neutron emission or gamma emission here. I'm saying just leave the nucleus alone. It has this excitation energy. It's gonna, it's gonna deform and it's gonna split into two fragments. If nothing is emitted, the total energy is conserved because the energy cannot go anywhere. So I have my 
total energy here, I arrive at session, and now I have, depending on where I am here, this, this is another case, I have a certain amount of energy here that is available, and what is going to happen to that energy? Kinetic energy of, of, of what, sorry? Of the fragments, that's one option. Uh, because when the fragments are formed, so let's say they are like this, what happens? Okay, little little help. What happens? Yes, they go like this. You have, let's say in the example of, uh, this was the previous slide of uh, biome, and so if, if this is uranium, so Z equal 92, and let's suppose that it splits into this, and I have no idea what 36 is, but okay, it splits into this, you have two, roughly speaking, uniformly charged spheres, or even if they are deformed, that are basically touching each other, because they come from a system that has deformed, and just at the point of scission, they are almost touching each other. The first thing that get, so now they are sufficiently apart that they are not these two systems are not um, subject to the strong nuclear force anymore. They are beyond the range of the strong nuclear force. So the only interaction there is between them that as that is relevant is the Kuno interaction, and because they have positive charges, they're going to fly away, and they are going to fly away with something called the total kinetic energy. That's the quantity that uh, essentially uh, represents this, this flying away of the two fragments. So one possibility for uh, this, this amount of energy is typically called the precession energy because it's available just before scission. So one possibility is that this precession energy is converted into kinetic energy of the fragments. That's one option. What is the other option? One other option is that the fragments are going to be excited, and part of their excitation energy could come from this. What's the answer? Nobody knows. This is very model dependent. We, we meaning theorists, try to calculate those quantities, and depending on which theorist you ask, you will get different answers. Some people will tell you, oh, it's all kinetic energy. Others will tell you it's all the excitation energy of the fragments come only from, I mean, this goes only into this, or this goes only into the excitation energy of the fragment. Uh, this, is, this is something that is not directly measurable, but it will have a consequence because the fragments are going to be excited. And the excitation energy of the fragments is going to lead to a decay of these fragments, and that decay is going to be proportional to how much energy they have. Quick estimate of this for uh, to sort of fix the ideas. Now I'm going to give some quick estimate. Uh, you can actually estimate this very simply by uh, taking the Coulomb energy for the purist. It's the direct Coulomb energy, uh, and this is oops. This is the fine structure constant, uh, 1.43, more or less. Let's say 56, 36. Uh, the distance of the order of 15 fermis. And so this is going to be of the order of 200 MeV. If you put 56, 36, and 15, you're going to get, I think, 185 or something like that. This is the typical order of magnitude of the total kinetic energy of fission fragments and fission reaction uh, in an actinide nucleus, so uranium, plutonium, and, and all these guys. This, that depends very much on uh, the nucleus and on other things that we're going to discuss in a few minutes, uh, but this is typically between, let's say, 10 to 30 MeV. That, again, varies a lot depending on, on various uh, things. So it's perhaps difficult to realize what those numbers mean, but this is a gigantic amount of energy that is available. And when the fragments fly away like that so fast, they're going to ionize the air, and it's going to be a source of all sorts of trouble. 
And that's why fission is a sensitive subject. OK. Uh, I think I may have a slide to show. Oh, no, no. That, before I show this next slide, uh, let me continue with the discussion. And I think now I should do this. OK, so we've seen that, um, we've already discussed that the fission fragments could be excited. And, uh, and their excitation energy of now the fission fragments, and here I'm going to give you again an order of magnitude because, uh, well, we have to fix the, the ID. And it's a bit like the precision energies. It's actually between 10 and 40 MeV. Uh, 40 would be in very special, special cases, but it can happen. Uh, that's the excitation energy that fission fragments have. How do we know that? Because we see what happens to those fragments when they are excited. They de-excite by emitting neutrons. Uh, we talked about neutron separation energy earlier. The neutron separation energy between 5 and 8 MeV, more or less. So if I have this amount of energy, I can emit more than one neutron, actually. If I have 40 MeV, I can emit plenty of neutrons. Uh, so fission fragments which sometimes I will abbreviate it like this, uh, can, well, de-excite. And just like the compound nucleus, it can de-excite by neutron emission. It can de-excite by uh, emission of gamma, or photon emission. What will happen typically is that the first thing is if the energy is sufficient, they're going to emit neutrons first. And then once that neutron emission cannot happen anymore because the energy is less than the neutron separation energy, then it's going to switch to uh, photo emission. This will happen very fast. This will happen uh, in of the order of, again, it's an order of magnitude, but 10 to the power minus 15 seconds. This is known as the prompt emission prompt particle emission. And if you're interested in the properties of those particles, how many neutrons are emitted, what's their average energy, what's their angular distributions, because they may be emitted in different directions, uh, same thing for the photons, the so-called photon multiplicity, so how many photons are emitted, what's the energy of the photons, what's their angular distributions, then these uh, observables, which can be measured, are called the efficient spectrum or the prompt fission spectrum. So this SO means, or this correspond to something called the prompt the prompt fission spectrum. Uh, if you, if this happens very fast, fission actually that 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 trajectory or that uh, motion of the nucleus through the deformation space, so going from that initial excited state to the point of scission, this is not something that can be measured, but this is something that can be calculated. And again, if you ask theorists to calculate something, you will have five different answers for two theorists. And so this is of the order of 10 to the power minus 19 to 10 to the power, power uh, 10 to the power minus 21 seconds. That's the time it takes to go from here to there. And once you've got there, that's the time it takes to start emitting stuff. Now, when you have emitted your neutrons and your photons, that's not the end of the story. Because the fission fragments that you, so of course, if you emit neutrons, you're losing, well, using neutrons. So you go from a fragment with Z and N to Z and N minus 1, perhaps N minus 2, and so on. But you still may have fission fragments that are unstable against beta decay. And so the last phase of the fission process is uh, the beta decay of the fragments. And so when we go, so this is step 1. Step 2 is beta decay. And so beta decay is you have a neutron that becomes a proton plus an electron plus an antineutrino. This can happen multiple times until the, the fragments, 
well, are stable against beta decay and do not decay anymore. Uh, this also during that phase uh, here we we in the prompt phase we talk about fission fragments after beta decay we tend to talk about fission products it's just terminology so this leads to uh, the fission is it is it over not yet because fission products may still be excited and they can de-excite by emitting photons, mostly. They don't have enough of, of uh, excitation energy to emit neutrons, but they can emit photons, and this is called delayed emission, delayed photon emission. And that's the last phase. Now, by the way, this beta decay, um, if you really want to wait until the end of the process, let's say you have a, a sample of uranium-235 that you've irradiated with neutrons, you've triggered fission, and then you decide I'm gonna, and then you stop irradiating, and you decide that you're gonna wait until everything has decayed, back to its ground state, back to stable isotopes. You could wait thousands of years, because some of these fission products are long-lived, and before they decay, it's gonna take a while. Which leads to all sorts of interesting stories or interesting uh, uh, complications when you try to make measurements and estimate those fission products. But that's, I'm not an experimentalist, so I'm not going to talk about that. So that's sort of the overview picture of the fission process. Just to recap, and I think I have a slide. This is a recap. Everything I said minus the ugly writing on the blackboard. Um, so we have, I didn't talk about this, but I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna talk about it now. So we have an entrance channel. I, was, I said I, was, I would be talking about induced fission. So you have a, an incident neutron hitting a nucleus. Uh, that nucleus deforms. It deforms up to the point that it splits in two. Those fission fragments first emit neutrons and then possibly photons, I mean, and photons. Uh, this is the prompt neutrons, these are the prompt neutrons and prompt gammas or prompt photons and the prompt, uh, prompt fission spectrum. And then the resulting fragments are going to beta decay more than one time, it depends on the, on, the, on the products, to lead from fission fragments to fission products. Okay. Now, one thing that is important to also realize... Absolutely. Yes. It fits me, yes. I can have my fifth coffee of the day, yeah. That's fine. Are we starting again or, yeah, okay. Okay, so um, let's recap. So the, this, this plot here was a, a recap of the overall fission process in simple terms. Now we're, gonna, we're going to talk a little bit, there are a few words on this, uh, on this graph like fission fragment distributions, which we are going to explain next. So when, when I say that the nucleus splits into two fragments, in reality, if you have a sample of material that you're irradiating with neutrons or anything, like, anything else uh, that triggers fission, in that sample of material, you have zillions of atoms. That means you have zillions of nuclei, and most of, many of them will fission, each time there is a fission event, it doesn't lead always to the same pair of fission fragments. Sometimes you have a situation like this where you have a big fragment and a small fragment. Sometimes you have two, well, two fragments that are essentially identical. And so we can now quantify this with a plot as a function of the mass of the fragment or the number of total number of particles in the fragments we can plot the probability that we have a certain uh, mass. And in fission, it's not P, it's Y. So the, it's called the yield. And in a typical um, reaction in an actinide, again, plutonium, uranium, and all this, you would have a distribution that looks like that. And if you have an even, even nucleus, this is gonna be uh, A over two, uh, sorry, this is gonna be the the A of the compound nucleus divided by two uh, at the midpoint here. 
what that means is, and, and this plot is also uh, symmetric, so if you have a fragment for this, uh, so this is a large number of particles, so this is the mass of the heavy fragment, then it should correspond, it should correspond to the symmetric, uh, which is, okay, it's very poorly designed, but it's supposed to be somewhere here. Up, and this would be the light fragment, so that the sum of this plus this is always equal to the mass of the compound nucleus, of the fissioning nucleus. Okay? These distributions, these fission fragment distributions, can be measured, and the role of theorists is to calculate them. But there are different such distributions. There is the one adcision. Imagine a thought experiment, you are a theorist, and you have plenty of fission events, and for each, you simulate those fission events, and for each of them, you calculate, you, you sort of uh, collect also all this information, and you infer what the yield should be for those fission fragments at the point of scission. So right here, at the point of scission, you have a certain uh, uh, distribution of fission fragments, which in this plot I call primary fission fragment distribution, before anything is emitted. But now I emit neutrons. If I emit neutrons, I'm changing the A of a fragment. So if a certain fragment here, if this uh, curve corresponds to the primary yields, if this guy is going to emit one or two neutrons, then it's going to move uh, left here. And if I plot now the distribution of fission fragments after all the neutrons have been emitted, this is going to be a different curve. In fact, there is no reason why these two systems emit the same number of neutrons. So the, um, the, curve, the, the curve of fission fragments is symmetric at scission, but after neutrons are emitted, it is not symmetric anymore, meaning those two, uh, those two blobs here are not identical. Okay? And then after beta decay, well, again, same thing here. You have neutrons that have been converted into protons that has also, well, that doesn't actually doesn't change A, but that changes uh, the other, there is another uh, kind of yield, which is the charge distribution. And in fact, so you have the charge, you have the mass distribution, and then these two should be obtained from a two-dimensional yield, which is the probability to make a fragment with Z protons and a total number of particles equal to A. And this two-dimensional uh, yield is going to be different at scission, it's going to be different after the prompt emission, and it's going to be different again at the end of the uh, uh, beta decays. And they have different names. Uh, after prompt emission, they are called independent fission fragment distributions or independent yields. And then after the uh, uh, the beta decay, they are called cumulative fission yields. Cumulative because the yield of a given element of a given uh, fission product comes from the accumulate. Oops, sorry, comes from the accumulation of many different uh, uh, chains of of nuclei through this neutron emission or this beta decay. So the question is about whether neutrons can be emitted at the point of scission, and in fact, the answer is that has been speculated, and they are called scission neutrons. <laughs> uh, this is model dependent. This is completely model dependent. It's impossible because of the time scales to really, n so imagine you, you have, if, if in neutron just fission, you have, let's say, a beam of neutrons. You're hitting a nucleus. Many of these neutrons are gonna be scattered. Elastically, inelastically, they're going to fly away because of scattering. Then the fragments are going to be very quickly fission occurs. The fragments themselves are going to emit neutrons that are going to go all over the place. And to distinguish between those scattered neutrons, the neutrons emitted from the fragments, and now if you add also scission neutrons, this is nearly impossible. In fact, as an aside, uh, the experimentally, it is extremely difficult to measure the probability of uh, scatter of neutron, any inelastic scattering of a neutron. The fact that the neutron is is not, you know, is, is scattered off the nucleus with a change of energy. This is very hard to distinguish these neutrons from the neutrons emitted by the fragments. 
So when you look at databases of uh, nuclear data, uh, this the, new, the inelastic scattering for this heavy nucleus is there is very little experimental data out there. It's extremely hard. Sorry, say it again. Correct. Yes, uh, but that, so now we are. No, no, no. But th but this is a good point because I would have completely forgotten about it. But this is actually important uh, in some particular applications. Uh, they are so far. I have really talked only about binary fission, where the fragment splits in two. But there are indeed cases. Uh, this was the question about ternary fission. There are cases where the the, the fission nucleus splits in three. Most likely, when it most often when it occurs, we have two fragments and an alpha particle. And the alpha particle is easily detectable, and so this is about 1% of all fission is going to be ternary fission. Uh, from a theory point of view, this is very hard to model uh, for reasons that might become clear later in the week or not. Uh, but this is this is one of the hardest things to do to model. Uh, there are a few attempts, but it's, again, very hand wavy. Um, do, do, do. Oh, yes. All right, so now, uh, now I guess I'm going to move. So remember, perhaps you remember, one of the initial slides, and actually, well, it's on that slide too, right? I was talking about deformation. What leads to fission is the deformation of the compound nucleus. Now, can we somehow relate these two types of, these different types of fragmentations, which are quantified by these yields, to the deformation of the compound nucleus? So imagine that you have a big fragment that is like this, and you have a small fragment that is like that, and just at the point of scission, we may have some, some, some situation like this. Well, if I look now at the, oh, this is really, this is gonna be difficult. If I look at the shape, of this object here, this would be the shape of the fissioning nucleus just before it splits. Anybody knows what is the feature of that shape? Hmm? Okay, you're all whispering, I cannot hear anything. <laughs> I, I, I think I heard some thing about symmetry, so anybody wants to try? This is reflection asymmetric. So people who do, if there are people among you who do nuclear structure calculations, yes? No? Yes, I'm getting there. So um, if you consider a shape like this, this can be described by uh, something called the octuple moment of a, of a shape. Uh, and this is a, a, sh a type of shape that breaks reflection symmetry. What is, what is yes? Do I call? Oh. So the the so the, the question is about um, the other types of decay, which are uh, which involve emission from the nu from the initial nucleus of say a carbon twelve uh, nucleus or something like this. So this is an extreme case where you have a very very light fragments, carbon-12 out of uranium, for example, and then a very heavy fragment. Uh, this is known as cluster radioactivity. Uh, this can be described by some of the methods I'm going to talk about later in the week as a very asymmetric fission process. So it is possible. It's also usually more energetic, so it, it's, it costs more to be able to, to make this kind of decays, which is why it occurs more rarely. But it, uh, yes, in principle, it is possible to describe this kind of exotic uh, fission. So if I have, uh, to go back to my shape thing, so if I have a, a shape of the fissioning nucleus that looks like that, this means that this is going to lead to uh, what is known as asymmetric I never know if there's 2M or not. Asymmetric fission, where you have a heavy fragment and a light fragment, 
But if I have a shape, that is like this, and that's supposed to be symmetric, it may not be very visible, but if it's symmetric, parity with, with respect to, to parity, then, well, this is gonna lead to what is known as a symmetric fission, where AH equal AL. And then if, if the system is even even, this would mean uh, A over two. And this means that in my, figures of the yield, Oops. reflection asymmetric shape correspond to a situation like this, where you have a heavy fragment and a light fragment. Uh, reflection symmetric shape correspond to a case like this, where everything is centered over A over two. Yes? So the question is whether we can have two situations at the same time, and the answer is yes. In fact, in a plot like this, this is not zero. The yield here is not, I mean, in linear scale and the way I draw things, it may look like it's, it, it vanishes, but in reality, there is a non-zero yield. What does that mean? That means that in a situation, in, in, um, I, will, I will show a plot later on on, on actual uh, data. In a, in a fission of plutonium-239, for example, most of the fission is asymmetric, but there are fission events that correspond to symmetric fission. Just like here, most of the fission is symmetric, but any one of these on the side, this is asymmetric. So in fact, we always have the two situations at the same time. What does, did I answer your question? I'm gonna get, I'm gonna go there. <laughs> uh, what we, um, that also means that when we do the description, when we try to map those deformations, when we try to predict the number of particles in the fragments, we have to consider all these different shapes. And in, this is gonna come back tomorrow and later on when we think, when we talk about potential energy surfaces and stuff like this, we have to consider enough degrees of freedom of deformation of the compound nucleus in order to be able to predict the different fission modes that we can see. If you want to see asymmetric fission, you will have to make calculations with shapes that are reflection asymmetric. But if you want to also be able to describe symmetric fission, the symmetric fission mode, you need to also to have reflection symmetric shapes. And this will lead to complications. Uh, that is so the question is about the probability of creating these shapes. That is gonna come uh, on Wednesday when we uh, look how to calculate these things. Yes? This depends on the system, on the nucleus. Uh, in, I am very biased because I work at the place where they only care about plutonium and uranium, really. Uh, for those elements, they are always like this. But in uh, heavier systems like fermium isotopes, fermium isotopes are nice because there is a transition between this and that. As you add neutrons, and I forgot which way it goes, but you go from asymmetric to symmetric fission. So one of the, around fermium 254 or 256, something like this, there is a transition. So it depends on the nucleus, completely depends on, on the nucleus. There are speculations that in very neutron rich nuclei, you may even have three peaks where you would have a likely asymmetric fission, but you would also have an almost equally likely symmetric fission. These are speculations, but it exists. This is, yes, the def so the question is about the, which deformation we are talking about. This is the deformation of the compound nucleus. So this is how you can, the concept to how you relate the properties of the fragments, the basic property, which is how many particles there are in the fragments, you relate these basic properties of the fragments to a property of the fissioning system of the compound nucleus, namely its shape. 
And this is a very and this is a very important concept. In fact, everything we do depends on this pretty much. Okay, so um, at this point, I think I gave most of the features of induced fission. I'm going to mention the two other types of fission that are somewhat important and uh, interesting for various reasons. Uh, and so I should go, I guess, here. So there is another type of fission, which is spontaneous fission. Uh, experimentally, this was in fact discovered uh, a little bit later in, uh, I think, 1941 in uh, Russia, which is why the paper was published in the Soviet journal, and I don't speak Russian, so I don't really have access to it, so I have no idea exactly what they did, but they discovered that some heavy element spontaneously fissioned, and so you could quantify that, uh, that probability with the uh, uh, fission, spontaneous fission half-life, usually called tau, which is the probability that in a, a certain, the time it takes for half a sample uh, to, to undergo fission. So in spontaneous fission, um, the situation is a little different from what we saw over there, because the system is in its ground state. The nucleus that fissions, by definition, is in its ground state. So it means that if I have my potential energy curve that looks like that, and then it does something, I don't know, uh, as a function of deformation, and then this is the potential energy as a function of deformation, and let's assume that this is the point of scission. I'm gonna draw it differently, there you go. So the system is sitting here in its ground state, very quietly, not bothering anybody, yes? That's going to come tomorrow. I do, the question is, how do you quantify deformations, right? This is going to come tomorrow. I, today, it's purely qualitative. Uh, it's like probably going to remain qualitative because I won't have time to talk about scattering cross sections. But uh, tomorrow, we're going to talk uh, on how you know put some numbers and some 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 math behind that. So in spontaneous fission, the nucleus is sitting in its ground state, and then after some time that is measured by that, we find that it has scission. Why does it happen? Tunneling. So the reason is because this is quantum mechanics, and in quantum mechanics, as you all know, you can tunnel through a potential energy barrier, so if you're here, you can go through that with a certain probability, of course, which you can calculate if you know the shape of that potential, uh, and we are gonna again, talk tomorrow and the day after about how you can do these kind of calculations. And if you are here, then you are back to the situation of induced fission, kind of, in the sense that your energy is above the barrier and you're, you're going to fission. You're going to move in this direction at this energy. You're going to get a lot less energy at fission because you started with less, but it will happen. And just like in induced fission, most of this this picture that is described here remains valid, meaning that once the system fissions, it will uh, create different, different fission fragments. These fission fragments will still be excited. They will be less excited than in induced fission, but they will be excited. They will emit neutrons, they will emit photons, they will be the decay. The whole, the whole thing continues. Is also valid for uh, spontaneous fission. Yes? You, so, uh, experimentally, um, in terms of the quantities you want to measure, they are pretty much the same, indeed. The difference is that some of these spontaneous fission half-lives are very long, which means if, if the half-life is a million year, you're not going to be able to really make a lot of experimental measurements because you know, it takes a lot of time to get any statistics. Uh, the other thing is in terms of the, the characteristics of uh, the prompt fission spectrum, because the fragments will have less energy, that prompt fission spectrum is going to be different. It's going to look different. But if, you, if you're thinking of measuring it, it's the same techniques. Uh, in, in fact, it may be easier in a way because uh, in induced fission, you have to deal with a neutron beam. 
Okay, if you do photo fission, it's a photon beam, but you have to have to quantify the energy of the beam. So you, you ideally you would like a monoenergetic beam, which is not necessarily that easy to make. Uh, and so you, there may be some technical difficulties in making a target of the nucleus you want to study. Some some uh, actinide nuclei are unstable, so you cannot just make a target of them because they decay immediately. Uh, in spontaneous fission, uh, if the half-life is not too bad, you just have to get your material and wait and, and count things. But yes, other than that, the properties you're measuring are pretty much the same. Now, uh, one complication in, in, in spontaneous fission is this figure here is very misleading. Uh, in reality, we already talked about the fact that we need to consider different kinds of shapes. So without saying really how we parameterize those shapes or how we calculate them, uh, if you need reflection symmetric and reflection asymmetric shape, you in fact are considering a potential energy in a two-dimensional space at least. Let's make it very simple for the moment. I'm just saying that I have a deformation here that is symmetric, whatever that object mathematically, mathematically is. And here I have another deformation now, which is, asymmet which is asymmetric, yes. And I have a contour plot. I have now in the third axis that I cannot do, there is the deformation energy. And there may be feature, there may be barriers just like that, but now it's in, you know, I have to visualize that in, in 2D or 3D. If the ground state is here, and let's say there is a, a fission barrier there, and then there is a, this corresponds to this, this value here, I'm going to go from here to there, but there are many paths that I can take. I can do something like that, like this, like that. And so now I have to do multidimensional tunneling. It's not just the, the simple quantum tunneling of, of quantum, that we learn in quantum mechanics with a square well or a, a step function or something like this. It's a little bit more complicated because I need to calculate the different paths and weigh them or you know, find a way to do this. We're going to talk about that on Wednesday or Thursday because it looks like I'm getting a little late. But Questions about spontaneous fission? Or in this vision? Nope. And then the third uh, case, which is somewhat arbitrary, I mentioned it just because it turns out it has been speculated to be very important in nuclear astrophysics, in particular in uh, rapid neutron capture process or R process. Uh, the third case is um, beta delayed fission. And so in beta delayed fission, What happens is, as the name suggests, you have a nucleus, which is Z and N, which is first beta decaying. Uh, so it's beta decaying into uh, Z plus one. I'm always considering uh, beta plus radioactivity. So it's decaying into uh, Z plus one, N minus one. Sorry for the poor. And then this guy is in an excited state compared to its ground state. And the excitation energy is such that you are above the fission barrier. And so you can fission. So this guy then go to fission. This is something that is possible. It is not really happening in stable, I mean, in, in the nuclei we are familiar with, but it, there has been studies that it could be a, a dominant mode of decay for very neutron-rich nuclei uh, and very heavy nuclei that are involved in the rapid neutron capture process. The, difficult, the, the technical difficulty, so here is pretty much that you now have to uh, describe that channel as well. If you want to calculate uh, beta delayed fission, you in fact have to describe the beta decay when beta decay doesn't necessarily lead to the ground state of the daughter nucleus, but to an excited state. So this means that you don't do just fission theory, but you have to do beta decay theory. That makes it a little bit more complicated. But other than that, just to go back to some of the question, once fission happens, it's always the same story. You make different fragments, they are excited, they decay, blah, blah, blah. Okay. 
Of course, there are other types of fission. I was focusing on neutron-induced fission, but you can induce fission by photons, by protons. I just heard at the break you could do it by electrons as well, by alpha particles, by a, a fusion reaction with a, like a heavy nucleus, two heavy nuclei that, that you make collide that could fuse and fission, so fusion-fission reaction. So there are different ways. When fission happens, this picture is always valid. And the probability that it happens depends on the channel, on the entrance channel. And this is what I want to talk about now, actually. I want to start talking about cross-sections, which is going to be a very dangerous area for me because I am not a reaction theorist and I don't really know much about cross-sections. So since these lectures are recorded, uh, hopefully some people can cross-check everything I'm going to say now and point out all the mistakes I made. Before I do this, uh, any question about these overall pictures of all the fission mechanisms? Yes. Yes? Oh, okay. So the question is how spontaneous fission is related to deformation and does it, like, does the nucleus deform to fission? Uh, the answer is uh, yes and no. Uh, so, if let's forget about the, the two-dimensional case. Let's just look at this one because it's simpler. Uh, this is quantum mechanics. So, just like in classical mechanics, you have potential energy and kinetic energy, right? You put a particle uh, at the top of some slope, and then it starts at zero kinetic energy. Then it goes down some slope. At the bottom, it has maximal kinetic energy and zero potential energy, but the total energy is constant. Right? So this is the same picture here. You have a deformation potential energy. In spontaneous fission, the nucleus starts in the ground state. It is in its ground state. But because of the rules of quantum mechanics, there is a probability to tunnel. So the way we would describe it is we would first calculate that quantity, that potential energy landscape, in reality, we should really consider many different deformations, but we, the first step would be to compute this deformation landscape. And then we'll have to calculate this kind of uh, probability of uh, tunneling. And this would tell us, uh, this would basically give us access to this information here. And then once the nucleus has tunneled through, it has a different deformation, so it has, in fact, you can think of it as teleported from the ground state deformation to another deformation. And once it's there, because it now it becomes more equivalent to classical mechanics, that it is above the potential energy landscape, so it will fission with a very high probability. So the probability of fission is the probability of tunneling plus the probability of, uh, I don't know how to call that one, uh, P prime, to go from here to the scission point. But this is almost equal to one. That depends on how the barrier looks like. So, yes, the nucleus deforms itself. Uh, almost instantly it goes from here to there, and then it follows some more classical deformation, like motion through the deformation landscape. Did that answer your question? Yes? Okay. Yes? Yes? Oh, yes, so the, the, the beta delay, the, the beta decay channel would be important to know this actual, this excitation energy here. That's why you need beta decay theory, to tell you what would be the excitation energy in the, in, in, in the daughter nucleus. But once, but you can also say this is, Let's say your friend is going to calculate that, and then your beta decay friend is going to calculate that, and he's going to go to a fission theorist and say, okay, in this nucleus, this is the excitation energy. That's the probability to make the nucleus through beta decay. And then after that, it's your job, you're the fission theorist, to do the calculation. So 
So the question is about are there any experimental observations of beta delayed fission? The answer is indirect, and because of that, still, I guess, somewhat speculative. Uh, the experimental evidence comes from our process simulations and how our process simulations match patterns that we see in, say, light curves and things like that. Uh, the, in order to reproduce some of the features of those patterns, one has to introduce beta delayed fission. Because of the uncertainties in all the nuclear data that enter our process calculations, I would still qualify it as speculative because maybe we are just compensating for things. Uh, but it's that's the only evidence we have so far. Because these things only happen for very neutron-rich nuclei. You need to be in that energetically favorable situation and in in the nuclei that we deal with in the laboratory, that never happens. You have to go into neutron-rich environments. Yes? So the question is about how shape coexistence play into these fission fragment distributions. Um, so shape coexistence, for those of you who are not familiar with it, this is mostly about what happens near the ground state of the nucleus, where you have nuclei, where you have, if you plot the potential energy near the ground state, you find that there are two or three minima that are close by. Typically, it would be a spherical minimum, a minimum that, has, uh, that is reflection, that is prolate deformed, like a rugby ball, and another minimum sometimes that is oblate deformed, like a discus. And those, those, uh, th these are different minima. They, they, they are, as I say, close by in deformation. They are separated by barriers. And because this is quantum mechanics, there are overlaps between, between them. And this leads to experimental signatures. Most of this is really near ground state. Um, this would, in a theoretical description, it would impact how we describe uh, the, so imagine that you have something like this now. Uh, you have, say, another minimum right there, and then uh, ground state would be like this, and then you have another here. Uh, so you would have, you would have us to calculate the probability that you are here, and that you then tunnel through there, and then through there. So this is, this is a complication, but it's doable. Another uh, aspect, actually, where it's, your question is, in fact, very relevant is um, in actual actinide nuclei, and I realize I did not really uh, talk about that for some reason. So the typical potential energy landscape would be like this. You have a ground state. And then you have something called a fission isomer. And then you have, uh, this is called the first barrier, this is called the second barrier, and this is called the fission isomer. And this is always the, def the potential as function of the deformation. The yield that you get if you fission from here, or let's say you have populated a nucleus that is, that is essentially associated with this uh, ground state potential well, the yield that you get is different from the yield that you get from there. And this can be measured and quantified. Uh, the existence of isomer is also going to impact the products. Because when the fission fragments decay, some of them will decay to their ground state, but other may be stuck in an isomer. And that will also change uh, the, uh, the overall information. This is quantified by a quantity called branching ratios. So this is. Thank you for asking a question that, yes, the, it's even more complicated than, than it looks. Any more question? OK, uh, officially, it's, should I go for a? OK. OK, so as I said, now I'm going to switch gear. and I'm going to talk about something different. And now for something completely different, if you know Monty Python. <laughs> Because um, I'm going to talk about the actual fission absorbables. I already had touched upon that uh, in the, during the discussion, but let's, let's put some words to, to it. Uh, and what can be measured, and therefore, what can be calculated. And this is not really visible in this figure, but 
uh, roughly speaking, you can distinguish the observables into two categories. The ones that are related to the probability that fission happens, and the one related to the fact that if fission happens, what do we get? Uh, the first class of uh, observables, the ones related to the probability of fission, it's, only a, it's really only one thing, and it's called the fission cross-section. And the second category of if fission happens, what do we get? Now you have a ton of things. You have the yields, and remember there are different types of yields. You have things like uh, the average number of neutrons that are emitted, uh, the average, I forgot how it's noted, but the average neutron energy of those neutrons. Uh, you have the uh, average number of gamma that are emitted, the photomultiplicity it's called. You also have the average gamma energy. You then have things like uh, the beta delayed spectrum. Sorry, beta decay spectrum. I feel I forget things. Well, I guess, and then, well, then you have the sort of delayed spectrum. And this is mostly a photon spectrum, so this is, this is go this goes back to this kind of thing, but uh, the ones that are emitted not very rapidly after session, but after beta decay. So this is, this is what you can measure to quantify the probability that fission happens. This is what you can measure to estimate uh, the uh, what has been product produced here actually I should say z of y of z y of a all these quantities depend on the energy of the fissioning nucleus if it's an induced fission that is me that means that those quantities are going to depend on the energy of the incident particle if it's a neutron what's the energy of the incident neutron for spontaneous fission well there is only one energy it's the one on the ground state Okay, so I want to first talk about this, and this is where I need to say a few words about scattering, because I assume that not necessarily everyone is familiar with scattering. But the bad news is I'm myself, I'm not very familiar with scattering. Okay, so now I have to get closer to my notes because um, I am entering dangerous territory. So, scattering cross-sections, in simple terms, uh, it's the probability per surface area. So it's the probability that something happened, that the scatter occur, but in in terms of uh, of surface of area unit. So we distinguish two types of cross sections. So because it is a probability per unit uh, surface, then it is it is it will quantify the probability that fission occur occurs, right? So, uh, what we call the differential cross section and the total cross section. The differential cross section is usually denoted by d sigma over d omega, and this one is just sigma. This, by definition, is the total number of particles that are scattered per unit time per solid angle. So it would probably help if I make a quick sketch of, let's say this is the beam axis and you have your incident particle. There is a surface area, which is d sigma. There is a beam, there you go. And then you have your, your target here. There is a deflection. We're gonna quantify things with an, an angle theta here. And then, uh, in some of the derivations at the beginning, I'm going to also use uh, an angle which is uh, here phi, but we're going to basically deal with an axially symmetric situation where everything is independent of phi because in practice, if the potential that this object, uh, so this, this target here creates a potential that uh, will influence the incident particle if the potential is central, then you can show that this indeed everything is axially symmetric. And we are going to use that simple situation. 
So this is, as I said, this is a number of particles uh, scattered per unit time in some solid angle d omega, which is going to be uh, this this little oops this little thing here. And then this is divided by the total number of particles that are coming per unit time. I am writing, it's my writing gets worse and worse, uh, per unit time in the initial uh, beam area. Now, uh, what that also means is that you can convince yourself that this is the scattered flux divided by the incident flux. So in simple terms, it means you have some stuff coming in and some of that fraction is deflected and you take the ratio of what's deflected to what's coming in and that's going to give you your cross section essentially the probability that there was a deflection. So how do we calculate that? We start with, uh, and I'm, I'm just going to lay out the, uh, the, the sketch of the, uh, I mean, I'm not going to go into very many details and I'm going to, they are, when you, um, when you look at scattering theory, they are what is known as formal scattering theory, which is hardcore mathematics, and that's not going to be my choice here. I'm going to use with the more simpler version of it, which is at my level. So you start with the uh, Schrodinger equation. What a surprise. So you have a target that creates a potential, and then you look at the um, uh, the wave function of the incident particle, which you write as, and uh, you can immediately start with the um, independent, time independent version of it. And so this is gonna be, as we know, the time independent Schrodinger equation. And if you have, um, in this case, we are taking into, we are considering the situation of a, a particle that is coming from infinity to the, to the left when the potential is zero and in this case the solution here is a, is a wave so we are looking at the we are only looking at solution that have a positive energy meaning actually larger than the top of the potential so if I have let me put it as a function now of the the beam axis let's say z your potential z is going to be something like that. I mean, anything, it's zero at infinity on both sides, then there is a potential, and then you're considering at what happens above that potential. So the energy, you're only looking at the energy higher than the potential barrier. And in that case, uh, you know that this is a wave that has, I always keep my the order wrong, so the energy is going to be p square over 2m, and this is also h bar k square over 2m. So you can plug that in. Okay, now what we are looking at is we want to know, yes, we want to know the asymptotic wave function when the particle is far to the right. It's coming in, it's far to, when it's coming in, it's, a, it's an incoming wave, and that means that you can write the asymptotic wave function to the right as an incoming plane wave, and with a plus sign because it's coming from left to right, and then it's deflected, so it's gonna look like It's going to look like a spherical wave. It's deflected, so it's going, you know, in um, like that. 
as a, as a spherical wave. And there is a factor here that depends on those angles, which is called the scattering amplitude. And if you want to make me feel miserable, just ask any question at any point in that demonstration, and I can tell you, you're going to embarrass me. Uh, in my You will have access at the end of the week, or probably actually more next week. I will put a, a list of all the formulas that I've shown. And I will also add references to textbooks and sort of review papers where I borrowed some of those uh, formulas. So that this is the way, if you want to know more, you can go, you will be able to go to these notes and check the references yourself. Yes. It's actually greater than Vmax. Yes. So this object here is the incoming wave, which I can call it incoming. And this object here is the scattered wave, which I will note like that. OK, I have five minutes. Uh, let's see how far can I go. OK, so now if I want to, ca to calculate these things, I have to, to do some counting. So let's do. It turns out that to calculate the denominator of this ratio, it's easier to work directly with the flux. But to calculate the numerator, it's actually easier to, you, to count number of particles. So the number of particles that are scattered is going to be proportional to, well, this is quantum mechanics. So this is going to be proportional to the square of the wave function and then divided, uh, multiply in by the uh, solid angle that we are looking at. So the probability to scatter dn particles in that solid angle is going to look like that. Uh, actually, sorry, it's going to look like this. And then we are going to write it like this, uh, the solid angle and the, uh, the dr of the volume element. Now, uh, I have to go. I need what? Oh, uh, indeed. Yes. I told you you would embarrass me. Yes, yes. <laughs> I am not sure. You know what? How it goes, it's going to go tomorrow so that I can check my notes because this is noon. And I think it, could, it's, it would take me a while to go all the way to the end. So perhaps it's the best time to stop now. And that will allow me to uh, cross-check things. Huh? Yeah? OK. OK. All right. Okay.